Hi, I'm Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest Facebook Live. And it's 11:30, not 12 o'clock. But Rachel has to go home because it's snowing like crazy. Uh, yesterday, I stayed downtown because it was supposed to snow like crazy. It, this morning, I walked from the hotel to work. It barely was wet on the ground. But now, I was in the lab working like crazy on 3D. Walked out, and it's snowing like like crazy. So. Though those of you on the East Coast, I hope it's not going to be too bad the weather for you all. But um, let's get started. So uh, if people come at 12 o'clock, they can watch the talk anyway. Okay. So this talk is on uh, pancreas, common misdiagnosis of pancreatic masses and pancreatic cancer. And this is a very important topic to us. I think we've written some articles about this in terms of misdiagnosis. And Linda Chu is putting together an article on some of the common misses. When we look at the pancreatic multidisciplinary conference at Hopkins, we see roughly 10 new patients a week. Some of the patients are newly diagnosed. Some are coming to Hopkins for second opinion. When we look back at all of the cases, and again, this is retrospective, and it's a retrospectoscope because in retrospect, everybody can see everything. I would say about 20 to 30 percent of the cases of pancreatic cancer were initially missed. Now I have to admit, those radiologists reading the studies were not reading rule out pancreatic cancer. It was vague abdominal pain, it was maybe a little weight loss, it was just some vague things. Often the protocols were done in the ER setting, sometimes there was no IV contrast, sometimes there was a crappy injection, there surely wasn't two phases, there wasn't thin sections. I can give you a million reasons why the technique wasn't what it needed to be. And we know that it's a problem. We know that for optimal detection of pancreatic lesions, you need optimal protocols. But in saying that, there were some issues over and over again that we see. So if you ask me what the most common thing where you could have made the diagnosis is, is you see a pancreatic duct and it stops. Okay, pancreatic ducts can be dilated, mildly dilated in chronic pancreatitis. Pancreatic ducts can be really big due to obstruction or main duct IPMN. But if you look at the pancreas and you look at the head, body, and tail, if you see a duct in the tail and it stops, if you see a dilated duct in the body and it stops, if you see a dilated duct in the head and it stops, or some combination of any of those, you need to make certain the patient doesn't have a tumor. And invariably the answer is they have a tumor. Yes, you can have a duct cut off of the patient had trauma, I think maybe I've seen one case of that and you knew the patient had trauma. Invariably, it's the duct cutoff that people don't recognize, and that really is a problem. So to me, sometimes, even with a great study, you'll see the duct cutoff, but you don't see a mass. People have written articles about isoattenuating pancreatic cancers. Some people claim 5%. I'm claiming it's more like 1%, 2%. But sometimes it's very subtle. And I've been doing, there was a, two cases in the last two weeks where the preliminary report was negative. I did the 3D and the cinematic and it was positive. So I will tell you that cinematic rendering, this texture mapping, super critical being able to pick up the presence of subtle lesions. But again, I did see the duct, so I knew there was something there. Now what if you do, if you see a duct cut off, but you don't see a mass. Well, Dr. Cameron would say there's obviously a mass we can just operate, and he's probably right 99% of the time, or in Dr. Cameron's case, he's right 100% of the time. But for the rest of us, you could do EUS, you could do MRCP. The answer is you can't do nothing, because if you do nothing, you're 100% gonna be wrong. So in that regard, you need to do something. And that is the most important finding, I think, to me, because those are often cases with small lesions, and those small lesions are resectable and potentially curable. Invariably, when we see the patient six or 12 months later, the patient unfortunately is unresectable. So that, that is uh, definitely a problem. Okay, that's one. Now, what else do we miss? I think sometimes we miss lesions off the tail of the pancreas or the head of the pancreas by the uncinate because they're small. And I've seen a lot of misses of uncinate tumors you know, the uncinate is a very sharp thing. It goes behind the SMV and near the SMA. If it looks fat or there's some low density, you have to worry that there's a tumor there. And I've seen a number of cases of very small uncinate tumors, again, would have been resectable, then presenting because they obstructed the SMV or the SMA or both. It's a very tough area. 
And I found myself a number of times not seeing the lesion until I looked even more carefully. And sometimes only because of the coronals or the 3D you see the lesion because your eye kind of walks away because the rest of the pancreas looks good. There's no dilated common duct. There's no dilated pancreatic duct. It's just this little uncinate lesion that can be problematic. That's another thing. Now, the comments I made about duct cutoff and uh, the uncinate and the tail of pancreas, perhaps, usually I'm referring to adenocarcinoma. Though, truthfully, with neuroendocrine tumors, you're going to have a duct cutoff, but sometimes you see a bright dot in the duct, and that's Satomi Kalamoto wrote that article. Uh, sometimes you can miss a very much tail lesion or confuse it with an accessory spleen. Sometimes you're overcall, sometimes you're undercall. Okay, fine. What else? Now, that's adenocarcinoma. What about neuroendocrine tumors? I have case after case of small neuroendocrine tumors, typically 3CM or less. Unless you have arterial phase imaging, you're going to miss it. You have venous phase imaging. There's no duct dilatation. There's no changes in texture. There's no borders. We're going to work on changes in texture with cinematic rendering and with uh, uh, Seaman Park doing radiomics. But the, right now, you may not see it. So it's very important you're doing pancreatic imaging, you have dual phase studies. Again, dual phase arterial is not the best phase for detecting adenocarcinoma, but it is a great phase for picking up neuroendocrine tumors. So I think it's very important to be aware of that. And so again, dedicated studies. I not uncommonly will see cases where it was one phase, red is negative, and then we do the study over, and sure enough, there's a tumor there, very bright. You can see it from across the room but it's there. Okay, what else? Now, sometimes we see lesions, and this is maybe not a mistake, but it's not exactly being correct. There's a big mass by the pancreas, and you call it a pancreatic cancer. And maybe it is a pancreatic cancer, but all of a sudden you notice there's no dilated common duct or pancreatic duct. And the epicenter for the mass is a little bit too much to the right. And when you look carefully, it's really duodenal lesions. We had a wonderful, we had a wonderful case a couple weeks ago, metastatic melanoma to the pancreas. I've seen a couple metastatic melanomas, big masses. I thought it was a gist tumor. So I always make the point that some of the CTSS lectures, if you see a mass by the pancreatic head, smooth and round, well-defined, big, 5, 6, 8 cm, no duct dilatation, just a mass effect, you got to be thinking about a duodenal primary. Now, adenocarcinoma is irregular, carcinoids are smaller and vascular, but gist tumors, particularly larger, Occasionally ulcerate, but usually not in the duodenum, and usually they're very smooth. So I think about a uh, just tumor. But I am telling you that we've seen some metastatic lesions now. Think melanoma. The three I've seen have been melanoma. Obviously, big masses around the pancreatic head. Again, thinking near small bowel, you can say lymphoma. But in lymphoma, you'll typically will see adenopathy as well in the mesentery, portal cable space peripancreatic region, periodic zones. So I think that's going to be a little bit easier. Okay, so um, that's fine. But again, I think the biggest mistake there you'll make is uh, having them biopsy the wrong biopsy with the thought of it being something else. Again, you know, one of the reasons you want to diagnose GIS is because with GIS you can treat the patient with chemotherapy first, right? Give Clevac, and then you operate. Adenocarcinoma, if you confuse that with an adeno of the pancreas, patients getting the same Whipple's procedure is not going to matter, and the chemotherapy will be done after the fact, so it's really not any real mistake for you. So I don't really see that as too big an issue, though our ego is that we always want to be right. But at the end of the day, being right is doing the right thing for a patient. So let me, uh, let me just look at a few comments here. Uh, you, Scott, made the point that a sister-in-law was diagnosed with adult-onset diabetes when, in fact, she would eventually be diagnosed to die from pancreatic cancer. It's very interesting. It's something we speak about and people are looking very carefully. If you have an adult in their 50s or even 60s and they develop diabetes and there's no good reason, you have to be super concerned that they may have or are about to get pancreatic cancer. We've seen case after case where the patient's history is, adult onset diabetes, and then three years later, they're coming back with a pancreatic mass. It's a chicken and egg thing. What's the cause factor? People are looking very carefully at that. But if you have a patient, and the history is adult onset diabetes, 
or in the last year the patient's diabetic and it's not really clear why, you better be looking really carefully that you're not missing a pancreatic cancer. And perhaps you should be examining those patients more frequently. It seems that they're a high-risk patient. Um, you also mentioned painless joint. This does not always present with pancreatic cancer. Um, yeah, I mean, the classic thing about pancreatic cancer is painless joint this, but that's because if you have a mass in the pancreatic head, obstructing the common duct. But remember, a pancreatic head has the most tumors, but if the tumors in the uncinate, it may not cause obstruction. No jaundice. Patients in the body, patients in the tail of pancreas, there's no painless jaundice. Now you remember, of course, patients who get painless jaundice, often they're lucky because if you have a lesion that early on obstructs the pancreatic duct and you get jaundice, those patients are often resectable. The problem with body and tail lesions is by the time they present, they've metastasized or they're so large, they're unresectable, local invasion, adenopathy, and distant med. So in, in some sense, you know, early jaundice could be a good sign. It's not a great sign, but it could be a sign of pancreatic cancer, but that patient probably has a better chance. Uh, best modality for insulinoma, Ahmad Azubi asked, classic. Is, uh, in the old days, remember, CT was probably 30% accurate for neuroendocrine tumors, insulinomas are often the hardest because they're one centimeter, and they're often multiple. With CT, dual phase, fast injection, high res, 95% accuracy for CT. It's the study of choice. Now, there was once an article from Hopkins that spoke about EUS versus CT. But the EUS was a touch higher, but the, quite frankly, the EUS was done after the CT found the lesion, so that's no great matter. Uh, you know, EOS sometimes can pick up small lesions, and neither technique is perfect. If you had a CT and you didn't find the lesion, then the EOS can't be done. If your CT finds a lesion, sometimes EOS is done on small lesions, so you can map the lesion and inject dyes. So when the surgeon goes in, they can do a partial pancreatectomy or a wedge. So that can be helpful, but CT is really good for that. Um, Question from uh, Melkami Abid, do you need to do a pancreatic protocol CT as a follow-up? Post Whipples, I think for adenocarcinoma, we routinely do that. You can argue you're looking for meds and maybe you get by with just a venous phase. But I think in terms of being able to look at texture, being able to look at recurrence, getting a good look at arterial and venous structures, I think the answer is we do dual phase imaging. It just gives us a better way of picking things up earlier. Uh, Someone wrote something in Spanish, and I have to admit, I can't, uh, Sahida wrote that, but I can't translate. I barely speak English some days, people will say, but I think also there's a, I don't think Facebook has what Google has where you can do the translation, so um, I apologize that I can't answer that question. Um, what else can I tell you with pancreas? I think uh, you look forward, I think we're doing deep learning. I think the Felix Project, which I've spoken a little bit about, we're getting to the 90% level for lesion detection of pancreatic cancer. So I think within a couple of years, you'll have deep learning as a second reader. Deep learning will increase your accuracy. I think it's something we're very excited about. It's something that I think you're going to see coming very quickly. So that's going to be a big thing. Uh, Linda Chu and Tomi Kawamoto and Seung Park are working on radiomics where they can look at the pancreas do a number of different mapping of textures and a number of different features and pick up subtleties to pick up tumor. Also distinguish between different cell types, be able to determine what's normal, what's abnormal, and who has pancreatic cancer. So I think you're going to see CT itself maybe not getting better perhaps, but the amount of information we can extract from CT increasing significantly. And the pancreatic cancer is the third leading cause of death now. It's about 45,000 new cases a year and about 45 or 50,000 deaths. It's number three with uh, breast and colon survival increasing with new chemotherapy and new treatment strategies. Pancreas could end up being number one. Not much has changed in three decades. We need to change the parameters. We need to change your equation. And there's work on vaccines. There's work on chemotherapy. There's work on combination therapy. Unfortunately, all that's been true for two or three decades, but hopefully we are getting closer. Maybe things like immunotherapy will be helpful in that regard. I'm not positive, but there is a lot of work going on. I apologize for the cold. Max gave me this great cold. But 
I think we're, we're kind of out of time. If anyone has any last second questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, if not, you can see some really good lectures on CTSS. We have a lot of good material, a lot of good cases. We just published, if you go to PubMed, there's an article on cinematic rendering of pancreatic tumors. It was in abdominal imaging, April 2018. It was published today. Actually, it's not April 2018. It's one of the future issues of abdominal imaging, but you could read it as an in-press article. If you go to PubMed and you just click it, it's also our pearl of the day on CTSS. So it's a wonderful article, wonderful pictures. Linda did a great job. I recommend you reading it. So with that, I hope all of you keep warm. I hope you keep out of the snow. And I hope uh, spring comes before Passover and Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And with that, and I agree with you, thanks again to, to Lunch and Learn. Catch you later.